Have you seen Inside with Bo Burnham? Oh yeah, it was great. <laughs> the yeah. Jeff Bezos song. Jeffrey is... Bezos. <laughs> you Congra- did. Congratulations. I literally died. Hour and a half. <laughs> That's died. like it's like Cause... 30 seconds and it's like the best part. <laughs> I feel like that like there's a little um Bo Burnham singing that song inside, inside of, of my head. dad's head because <laughs> my dad's like billionaires are earned every money they got <laughs> and there's just a little guy like you did it Jeffrey Bezos you're, you're the winner <laughs> it's a weird it's like I'm like wow it's a weird thing to to be indifferent fine but like to be so defensive of them is like kind of it's kind of that's what the whole thing is it's like yeah what, he doesn't yeah. need your protection you did or- it you won <laughs> I mean I was in New York like the last couple of days <laughs> <laughs> it's just like it came up a couple different times because all my friends giving me a hard time for like really enjoying inside and oh i love um, it oh it was amazing and <laughs> yeah i don't know it just came up that it was like jeffrey bezos won he just won so that's great game over game yeah. over we can all just not try anymore um are you in like a positive mental place really? yeah Sure. So I totally. am, I am too, and I loved inside. Okay, good. <laughs> and then some of my friends that I think are not doing well, like with their mental health, hated it, and they're like, "It's just depressing." And I was like, "Well, yeah, that's like the whole. That was like the whole point. Like it was. I. I mean, I also I watched it, and I was like, "Wow, like I am really enjoying this." I know a lot of people aren't. A lot of people just aren't going to get it, and that's cool. Um, but I hope that everybody comes across a piece of art that they enjoy as much as I enjoyed watching that. Mm. Cause I was like having, I mean, uh, yeah, it was great. I just, uh, yeah. And also the fact that like he locked himself in a room for a year. Yeah. I, like, do you um, think he locked himself in the room? No, 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 no. That I was don't like think his he locked himself in the shed room. or, you know, like yeah. outbuilding. Or then he would go to like his multimillionaire mansion. Exactly. You know? Yeah. No, he so, doesn't live in that thing. But that was also, that was half the part, too, is that it was like, how much of this is performative? Like, when he's, like, when he, like, cries in front of the camera, it's like, you know, is he crying because he's sad, or is he crying because, like, oh, this is in the script, this is part of the hero's journey, part of the film, he needs to have a low point, um, or is it both, and what does that mean? And, that was, you know, it was, it was a very interesting film. Um... We talk about elevated reality in a different episode. What but, the, does that mean? Well, so like basically, like when you're on uh, acting in a movie, you have to act natural, but mm-hmm. like a little plus, like a little extra. Mm-hmm. We're having a conversation, but we also know that there's a camera and there's microphones. So the like the conversation oh, <laughs> is like you know just ever so much. If you're in theater, because there you know back in the day there was no you know projection system big screens there were no microphones everything is like very much over the projected top and over so that's like a highly elevated reality kind of thing yeah um so like bo burnham there's probably truth behind the crying mm-hmm. but he it also was like conveniently when he was mid-roll kind of thing so but before we before yeah, we, what do we have to do let me kick this, this up, up. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of this, The Creative Truth. Today I'm joined by Clinton Edminster, the owner of Starlandy Art Supply mm-hmm. Store in the Starland District, downtown Savannah, Georgia, downtown-ish. And uh, I'm super excited because if you know, if you've been in Savannah long enough and you spend enough time in the Starland District, you start to see his face a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so I'm like honored that you take a, take some time out of your day to come talk to me. So. Um, will you tell the audience a little bit about like where you're from, what your background is? I said some, to someone earlier, like he has to be an artist because he has an art supply store. <laughs> I hate art. Yeah. I, I hate figured. it. It's I just horrible. Um, and it's just a waste of time, really. Um, not no. essential. I'm <laughs> not as, essential. As we yeah, 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 yeah. Nobody needs to be an artist. It's not fun. You don't gain anything from it. And the world would be a better place without any art. If we just it's a true belief. It's what I really believe. Of course. Yeah. Um. Totally. No. Let's see. What was it? What was the? What was the? Uh... Where's Where's your? Where are you from? Oh yeah. How'd you end up in Savannah? If you're. Oh no. Uh oh. Oh. <laughs> and then uh, what you so do? Long. Um. All right. Well. Uh. Hey. Thank you for having me on the show. It's always exciting. I love to talk. Um. <laughs> Especially this early, I was already at an earlier meeting, so I've, I've, you know, I've had some it. coffee, 
and I woke we're up here. For this, That's crazy. So. <laughs> I yeah, am here. Um, I grew up in Alaska, which is pretty cool. I grew up in Homer, Alaska, um, and I did. I had a wonderful childhood, um, and had um, a smaller Lego set than any of my neighbors, and that's probably everything anybody needs to know about me. And actually, no, I had a really great childhood. I feel I was just a uh, kind of a read a lot and made movies and was interested in a whole bunch of different stuff and was kind of a prankster in school um, and uh, ran for school president, which was fun. And I beat Wyatt Raider's ass. And that was great. Cause I'm, uh, yeah, that was probably the only time I ever won at anything. Um, and uh, living in Alaska was really cool, and I feel like that. Um, and and the work that I did there, I worked with my dad in the summer on a boat, on a salmon boat, and that really provided me with a lot of very, very helpful foundational skills and assets to be able to um, overcome challenges and problem solve, um, which has been hugely beneficial, really, in in sort of anything I do. Um, and so I've I've found that to be very very cool, very helpful. Um, and uh, which makes you my second Alaskan fisherman on the planet. Yeah, it's weird. somebody's going from here to go fishing, which yeah. is absolute madness. And um, but I came from fishing to come here. My fa- my family's actually still up there. My sister just bought a boat, and she's out there now, fishing, which is cool. It's Do her you go first visit? year. Yeah, uh, yeah. I go up. Um, I haven't been up since you know, like the plague. But I have been, I usually go about once every year, year and a half or so. Um, It's interesting, like I feel like my relationship with Alaska and um, I probably don't think I'll end up moving back there, but it is a beautiful space. Um, But there is no city planning at all. And sometimes it drives me a little bit nuts how beautiful Alaska is and how um, disruptive Whoa! <laughs> the building is haunted. magic. <laughs> I just feel like um, there's no city planning, and even small cities just sort of sprawl out everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it just to me seems very disrespectful to like how beautiful Alaska is. To just have this sort of like sprawl, um, which I guess is like a problem everywhere in America. But living in the downtown core of one of the most well-planned cities like in the world. Here being Savannah, it's an, it's an interesting contrast between living down here and then going back up to Alaska and seeing the development patterns and how um, they are different. So what is your background or interest in city planning? Then? Oh, um, uh, like so much stuff, I think. So like I didn't graduate from college. I dropped out um, from the arts college that is here. And, um, but then I just started getting involved in, well, really, I feel like it was, um, I got involved in arts organizing through a nonprofit called DeSoto Row and just did a lot of work around arts advocacy. And I sort of built up a repertoire and a name for myself by doing that because there was a gap. Nobody was really doing that. Um, and then honestly, like Tyler, there's this really specific point in, uh, God, it must have been like four or five years ago where I was sitting at a bar with a bunch of artsy fartsy friends and they were talking about like all these new blogs and all these new artists and I realized I have no idea what any of them are talking about at all. But what I do know about is, you know, I don't spend a lot of my time thinking about the art world. I do spend a lot of my time thinking about like urban planning and city mm-hmm. planning and engineering and infrastructure. And so I realized, <laughs> huh, I could probably do better with applying some of my free time to advocating for for stuff like that so for infrastructure for public art not necessarily for arts um or i guess they're both you know they're sort of inextricably tied um but i realized that really i've got a passion for like city planning infrastructure the built landscape transit stuff like that and so i kind of started to shift and um, was was thankfully able to sort of say like, hey, look, like I was really effective as an organizer in the arts. Like, will you let me be an organizer around city planning and or, or neighborhood community development? And it's not like anybody said yes, because it's not like anybody's in that position. But I feel like the city 
was very favorable to um, having some extra energy and some extra input from myself um, to help with advocacy around those fronts. So does that make any sense at all? It does. Okay. Um, I mean, and you're providing, you know, what, what, at least what from the outside people would be like the a more artistic uh, perspective. Yeah, to, I get to, that a lot. To a lot of like engineer minded people. Oh, yeah. Kind of that happens a lot. Yeah. So <laughs> what, what brought you to Savannah in the first place? Um, I came to the art school here. Oh, for, and, okay, for school. Yeah. From, from Homer. From, from Homer, I, I ended up spending a year, my final, my, my uh, senior year of high school in a arts boarding high school in California, which was okay. awesome, called Idlewild Arts Academy. And there I did, I was in film and television. Um, and I got really interested in visual effects. And so I wanted to move into doing visual effects full time at Pixar. That was like, that was my goal. Like that was what I wanted to do. And I had a 30 year plan for how I was gonna do it. And I spent two years in university kind of going that way. And then I realized, oh, I definitely don't want to know what I'm doing for the next 30 years. Like I literally had this like written out plan. It was like, okay, do this and do that, do that and do that. And then you'll end up at Pixar. And um, and I looked at that list and I was like, that is the most boring thing I could ever do. There's just no actual interesting like life adventure there. Um, so I dropped out of school <laughs> and I'm really glad that I did. I feel like it was a good decision for me um, and one that everybody should at least contemplate that you have the ability to make that decision. Um, although maybe it's not the best decision for you at the time. And that's how I got to Savannah. Because I wanted to go work at Pixar. I wanted to do visual effects. So and at the point you stopped attending said art school in Savannah, yeah. um, you were like 20? I don't remember. But it's been a minute. And 20? 21? What would you do then? So then I got involved in... Um, I, was, I was at Foxy Loxy doing literally nothing. And I heard a guy at the bar you know, talking to the barista and complaining that no volunteers were showing up. Volunteers were crap at showing up to his nonprofit arts gallery. And I was like, I bet I could show up. And I did. <laughs> and I have uh, for like the last nine years. Um, and so so I started volunteering at DeSoto Row Gallery, which was in the Starland District. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that was, yeah, that was in 2009, 2010. And, you know, Starland was very different back then. And DeSoto Row was about literally the size of this room. And we were a tiny little gallery. And I was just, you know, started out as a volunteer. And then I would make posters. And then I would, like, watch the gallery. And then we had a coup. And we overthrew the board. And I became the executive director. And then we multiplied the size of the organization over four years to, like, a close to $100,000 budget. And then I started Starlandia in 2015 and um that's kind of how that story goes and in the in the in those times when we were growing that budget um we changed the name from DeSoto Row Gallery to Art Rise Savannah hmm. and we had a really awesome core group of um of folks both volunteers and and like one paid staff too it was like myself and Kayla Goggins um and and we produced three different programs. Uh, we had a gallery, nonfiction gallery, which is where um, there's like a new spa that opened up next to Bull Street Taco is. And we had a arts newsletter called the Savannah Art Informer. And we ran the first Friday Art March for five years in a row, every month on the first Friday. And um, that was by far our most impactful program. And it's still kind of going on today. Hmm. And then in 2015, I decided to open Starlandia and then ended up having to leave ArtRise because it was just too much to handle. Um, and it sort of dissolved after that point. Um, there are some other art supply stores in town. So what was like the, uh, the idea like, oh, I think an art supply store on Bull Street where... Like you said, it wasn't what it is now. Mm -hmm. Why did you think like, oh, this would be a good idea? Um, well, mainly the business model was different from the other um, uh, retail stores in town. There was a we had an entirely different sort of a business model, which prov which is a, like a hybrid of new and reclaimed um, 
assets. And so what that allows us to do is provide um, the lowest cost uh, for supplies, hands down. And so that sort of gives us a freedom to be able to be in business. Um, uh, margins on art supplies or margins in retail aren't necessarily that great. But with the reclaimed aspect, um, we definitely were able to, like, you know, get started. Mm -hmm. And I think the location was key. And really, I knew I wanted to be within, like, two or three blocks, like, of that intersection. Because um, I, I had been involved with the Starland District um, for a while and saw, like, its growth, saw its potential. And the potential for the Starland District is embedded in two things. A, the layout of the streets and the zoning and you combine that's the hardware that that location is running on and it's excellent hardware you've got a well coordinated um, grid pattern of streets and you also have fantastic zoning um, which allows for very flexible mixed use space with high density and so if you've got if that's the hardware that you're working with then you bring in the software which I would describe as the businesses um, the events you know sort of the stuff that's living on top of the actual sidewalks and infrastructure of the of the area um what you end up with there is just a fantastic mix that is very resilient um and and is and is and and will grow it just will grow and then you add to that sort of the pressure of downtown of downtown savannah being very successful and it's sort of just this geometry of growth is happening in this direction what's going to happen here we can't go up. We can't we go can't, up. We, we can't. We can't go north. We can't go up. We can't go east. So you can't go west. Yeah. So you know, if there's a car coming towards you, what do you think? And you're over here. What's going to happen? It's going to hit you at some point, and it is, and it has, and it will be. Um, and and so I, you know, I just sort of saw that coming, and I think a number of folks did, and. And also, that's where I was living, and I'm really lazy, and I just don't want to have to <laughs> like walk anywhere. <laughs> like, and I didn't have a car, so I needed to open a business that was like near where I lived in walking distance. Um, and um, so, yeah. So, um, you stepped down from Art Rise. You now you you've opened up Starlandia. Are you working like? Are you manning the store yourself? Or are you hiring employees? Oh, we've or? just got the best employees. We've got we've got the best employees. My deputy store manager right now is Emma, and then we also have Olivia, we've got Mary, and we've got Dylan. And then we also kind of have Sam and we um, sometimes my friend John helps out. Um, and also my good friend Kobe who uh, comes in the store sort of randomly and helps us out. So, I mean, yeah, we've got a crew of people um, working on the store. Mm. All the time, processing stuff, inventorying stuff, you know, merchandising, cleaning. I mean, it's like it's a full blown operation and we pay taxes, which for me is sort of like, you know, like we're, we're a legitimate store, like which which always blows my mind is that we're like a full blown actual operation. I've got a bookkeeper. There's a CPA. Money comes in. A whole lot of money goes out. People get paid on time. You know, it's like it's a functioning business. And that is still blows my mind that that's actually happening, you mm. know, like and uh, and that, that's my source of income. That's how I get paid. You know, that's how I afford my car. And I was going to say this coffee, but this was provided to me for free. So uh, thank you for the There's coffee tip jar over there. Yeah. <laughs> OK, no, no, <laughs> I don't see any. <laughs> no. Um, so what about your um, your dad? Is he still a, a fisherman? Yeah, my um, yeah. So my dad is nuts and the coolest person and such a mystery, um, and definitely the hardest worker I've ever met in my life. And he is still a fisherman up in Alaska. Um, he is working with my sister on her boat, so she's actually Captain Morgan now, and he is not Captain Mark. Um, I don't know what that's called, Deckhand Mark, um, which I think is cool, and that's going to be an interesting interpersonal conflict that <laughs> you know because yeah. like because like he's always been because my sister and me would go out as deckhands working mm. for my dad for like seven or eight years um and my sister longer than that and so this is an interesting switch where now it's like okay morgan's in charge dad's the deckhand but he's also going to be you know this like wise philosopher of information and um and also probably pain in the ass uh because that's what 
great dads are. Um, but he, in the summer, usually works on a boat as like a boat captain. Mm. Um, um, and he's someone, he usually in the past couple of years gets contracted out by folks who own boats to captain that boat. And then in the winter, he's a refrigeration mechanic, or actually he creates refrigeration units for crab boats. Hmm. So you need to put crab in cold water. Um, and so he creates saltwater refrigeration units where salt, wa- cold, you know, fairly warm salt water comes in and very cold salt, salt water comes out. And these machines are so cool looking. They look like pod race engines, you know, just hmm. kind of a long tube. And... Um, it's incredibly complex and and really like a work of art um and it's just like a a a true feat of plumbing in a very small very detailed scale and i'm blown away that he knows how to do that is he artistic at all well you know i think like what does that mean like what does that mean you know and i would say like when i look at those machines all i see is like is absolute art Mm -hmm. i mean there's an art to being able to like weld things together well there's an art to being able to solder copper and aluminum together you know there's an art to to just making the whole thing work and flow and this combination of form and function um and it's been interesting because he'll create a refrigeration unit, um, which sort of looks like a like a an engine, you know. Like if you were to look at an internal combustion engine, it's mm-hmm. got you can tell that it's got you know there's a lot of different parts, and it's usually all the same color. And he's recently started to paint these different vibrant colors, and they look like a three dimensional like Mondrian painting of like bright white, bright blue, bright red, and each one is sort of like you know. The uh, the condenser is red, and the piston casing, I have no idea what I'm talking about right now, <laughs> is blue, sure. you know? And, like, the wheel, the belt wheel house thingy is, is, is white. And so you can look at it, and you can start to understand visually, you know, that, that the machines that he's creating are, are smaller machines working together f- to achieve the goal um, that he is, you know, or any inventor or any, you know, any... Um, person is uh, is working on um, so I would like you know I would say that he 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 does because I think that he takes he he works on this stuff with care mm-hmm. so what was like your first exposure to you said you'd like grew up making movies and you know um, did did he or somebody have a camera that you were able to play with um, or was it just in school? Yeah, no, like you know, my family had like a like a VHS camera. Yeah. Um, so you'd shoot with, with linear style, where it's like you shoot this scene and then yeah, you shoot the yeah, next scene in yeah, order and yeah, and then you just you know you figure out how it works and it's and then you you know I remember figuring out like stop motion and then like being able to splice and then I mean this was also so interesting because I feel like I grew up from like. When I first got into it, it was like this enormous VHS machine mm-hmm. with like, and everything was like, you know, light blurs everywhere. And then as I got older, like by the time I graduated, it was, it was the iPhone. Like I graduated from high school the year that the iPhone came out, which was sort of like the end and the beginning um, of like digital media. And <laughs> yeah, I remember like my life conflict was how do I get film into the computer? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, all these things are so expensive. Like all I want to do is get film into the computer. Once it's in the computer, then I'll be fine. But it was this whole, you know, we had to, my friend Trevor and I would make all sorts of little short movies and stupid little Star Wars things. And, um, And you just figure out how to problem solve, you know, like with any of it, I think, um, you just figure it out and you get uh, comfortable with making a ton of mistakes thank you there we go um That's so crazy i like that <laughs> it's only that one so it's yeah. like it keeps the guests uh mm-hmm. focused and yeah i am <laughs> so focused um you seem like you're very committed to helping the savannah community but you also mentioned that like maybe someday you would go back but like is there something about- oh no i definitely won't Okay, you definitely. Won't. <laughs> I don't think. I don't think I'm gonna. End you're up you're back changing in the record. Also, I don't think I'm gonna end up. My like my dream plan is actually to have like a couple different, um, is is to have a couple different homes. Yeah. Um, where Same. I feel comfortable in, and mm-hmm. one of them will. It's too always hot in the summer Savannah. here. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty toasty. <laughs> one of them will always be Savannah, and um, 
you know, I do like the idea of, uh, yeah, life is long, so I don't know. I'm not gonna. I'm not planning on. Yeah, I don't even know how to answer that question. Uh, so, well, what is it about Savannah? You said it. You know, like, what is it about Savannah that you like? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I know. Um, that, I know the uh, city planning is something you've grown to kind of really appreciate and love. It is. I would also say that Savannah is in the South, so there's a whole bunch of, of there's a whole bunch of societal challenges to overcome that I have never been exposed to or never was exposed to in Alaska, mm-hmm. which is. Um, been absolutely fascinating um i think dealing with like the the legacy of race the legacy of slavery the legacy of being an old old ass state in like one of the founding countries in america um is entirely new and definitely a uh a a complete challenge and an opportunity to learn more about like how i operate and how i try to work in the world um that i that i don't think I would have ever been exposed to in Alaska and I and I can kind of you know when I talk to a lot of friends up in Alaska or even in like Seattle or Portland it's kind of just this like it's just I feel like they haven't had the same um they haven't had to figure out like the same challenges and 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 uh resolution of America as much as we have to down here in the South, um, which is like, you know, in, in some circumstances kind of frustrating, but also like such a fantastic, you know, ability to like grow and become a better person. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's something I've really, you know, I really like that. I really like that about the South. I really like that about really any place that, um, just has a lot of diversity and is really open to, kind of taking a deep breath about itself and trying to do better, um, which I do think we are trying to do in Savannah, although it's sometimes difficult to see that. Um, and then also the size of the city is really, hel- has has been um, really effective at being able to like prototype different ideas out and and do different projects. Um, I think it's been, you know, like for the for the art march, uh, for the first Friday art march, the city was um, very uh, interested in, in seeing that. And, and when I say the city, I don't mean the government, but it seems to me that like the community was really interested in seeing that work um, and trying it out. And and I would say the same with Starlandia as well. And a whole bunch of different sort of projects I've been involved in is that you can kind of prototype something. It's not so big that you're going to, you know, brr, you have to have like an enormous amount of capital to get something started. And it's not so small that no one cares, that no one cares. Um, it is kind of in the sweet spot. And I think that's actually specifically more to like downtown and 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 really it's i i think you know that's a when i'm talking about like the community i guess that's people who have access to that through transportation and like um who can get to the things that i've been trying to prototype or working with groups to try to prototype uh what kind of groups oh wow that's a um hmm. because i know you're super involved and i listen to you on other podcasts so yeah yeah. so um so wait what what question am i answering now so what um organizations have you gotten involved with since you found this interest in city planning oh well probably one of the first ones was the savannah development and renewal authority um which at the time was run by no, no, no. Back up a little bit more. At ArtRise, we came across this idea of creative placemaking, and it really spoke to me a lot. And it's this whole idea of sort of like using creativity to... There's a whole bunch of different ideas about creative placemaking. But one, you know, one way to think about it is it's using creativity and art to activate spaces in your city and make them better, safer, stronger, more economically sound. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever goal you want or combination of goals. And... So a couple different ideas. Uh, there are murals, uh, parklets, which are those where you take over a parking space and you turn it into outdoor dining or you turn it into a little park. Um, uh, you know, uh, interesting, colorful crosswalks, um, events, uh, outdoor marketplaces. These are all sort of ideas where you're using a bit of creativity to leverage the resources that are already present and present them in a new way. And... And when I saw that, 
and some of the work that Art Place America was doing, um, which is I think I think that's what it's called. Um, there's some like there's some really cool ideas around that that I was like I want to be involved in that like that's what I want to do. So at Art Rise we worked on a couple different projects in partnership with the Savannah Development and Renewal Authority. One of them was a Better Block where we took or the Better Block Starland where we took sort of the uh, uh, the 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 template for the art march and applied it to an afternoon on a Friday but focused it all on a block that we shut down on Bull Street so we shut down like three city blocks we created like bike lanes and crosswalks and murals and all this stuff and um, and it was hugely successful and then it rained a lot um, and that was a really fun combination of being able to see like what can city streets do for us in different ways if we don't hand them all over to traffic. Mm-hmm. And it was really fun. Um, and then a couple of years after that, I ended up joining the board for the SDRA. Um, and then they defunded the whole thing, which was sad. And uh, so I've been involved with the SDRA, the Thomas Square Neighborhood Association. Um, I did a lot of work there. Um, is that basically like Starland. Starland slash Thomas Square? Like Yeah, Starland is within Thomas Square. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And did a lot of work there. Um, got a lot of heat for supporting a lot of projects. Um, I'm very pro-density and I'm pro-developments um, and I'm pro-housing, any housing. You want to build luxury housing. You want to build affordable housing. You want to build middle-income housing, workforce housing. I really don't care. Um, as long as it's got the word housing in it, then that's great. And I'll definitely probably support it. And I continue to get a lot of heat for like my views on housing, but I've become honestly a lot more unapologetic about it. And we just need to build a crap ton of housing, you know? And again, like rich people need to live somewhere and poor people need to live somewhere. And if a rich person wants to live or a poor person wants to live, then the rich person will win. And like, that's Mm -hmm. not a bias. That's just a fact. That's just called real estate in a like capitalist market. And unless we want to try to like solve capitalism before thinking about how we're going to deal with it locally, then okay, be my guest. But (laughs) that's going to be a big challenge. And I would say we just need to build more housing. Um, And I think a great a great a great example of that is um, I was a big supporter of the new SCAD buildings where uh, on Victory, mm-hmm. which are enormous, and they um, at an MPC meeting, I, I read a statement that was in support, and then a commissioner who was voting on whether to allow for higher density or an extra floor or something like that said, "Won't this building lower the cost of, of housing? Won't this building?" Um, uh, how do you put it? Won't this building decrease the amount that landlords can charge in housing around the area? And yes. I was like, well, duh, that's the absolute point. That's exactly why we're doing this. Because yeah. people want two things at the same time. They want their housing, they want their housing value to go up if they own a home, and they want people to have affordable housing. And those are literally diametrically opposed. They are diametrically opposed. I don't think there's any sort of give around how if your housing is more expensive, your housing is going to be more expensive. And I think one of the best ways to combat that is through a market-based approach where you provide more options in the market. Supply. You just provide more supply. Although that takes a a while to do. I mean, houses can't just come on board like that. They have to be zoned correctly and they have to be, you know, built correctly and they have to be built to code and it's expensive. And new housing is very likely not going to be the most affordable housing in the area. But we still need to build it. And additionally, we need to find ways to subsidize the building of new housing as well so we can have that be as close to affordable or market rate as we can. There's usually way too much um, negativity around new development and new housing. Mm -hmm. And people usually, you know, everybody's like, those new apartments are ugly. And they're too, (laughs) you know, they're they're ugly. But if they were pretty, they'd be expensive, Mm -hmm. you know? And if they were, I mean, it's expensive to build stuff. It's expensive to build stuff. The, and um, it just is. It just is. And I think we've got to find, I would like city council to be far more aggressive at being able to find ways to make those costs lower. And I think some of the best ways to do that are through zoning. 
and so not requiring as much parking, um, being able to create smaller rooms, being able to build taller, being able to build to the maximum of the lot that you're building on um, are all really effective ways at allowing developers to build to maximize that cost um, or to maximize their investment. Have you spent time in any cities that are similar as far as like size and? I haven't. So, you know, that might just throw out all the things I just said, <laughs> but I have just not. Curious, just curious. I have not. Yeah. Um, Sudan has really been like the only place I've lived other than like Homer, Alaska, which was like 6,000 people and Idlewild where, um, yeah, I was living in like the school housing there. Yeah. I, when you're here, there's kind of like this intangible something. Um, Je sais quoi, right to Savannah mm -hmm. like this magic a little bit at least a lot of people have that same kind of center like I don't know what it is but there's just something about Savannah um, and yeah I wonder if that exists in other places and to me it feels like people don't know about the southeast yeah region, generally speaking like they go to I want to go on a trip I want to go to you know out west basically everyone wants to go out west and no one wants to go to the south. And uh, and then the people that do come to Charleston, Savannah, St. Augustine, they're like, oh, it's like pretty nice. And people are accepting. And I was like, yeah, People are very nice. Yeah. There's a southern charm, but then there's mm -hmm. also like a, just every walk of life type of people. Um, maybe sort of an aside, but when I was recently in New York over the weekend and I went and checked out a couple different art supply stores to see like, how do they do it? Um, cause we're running into a space problem at Starlandia. So we're having to go up and denser. Mm. And so New York's a perfect place to consider, okay, if you know, real estate is really expensive in New York. So how do you maximize, you know, the amount of product you can You're put? You're in the grocery store that things are. Yeah, no, literally. And they work, they work <laughs> yeah. great. Yeah. Um, and it kind of adds to it, but one thing I noticed is that you walk into an art store in New York and and um, and nobody greeted me. Like nobody yeah. greeted me. And that's my number one pet peeve at the store. Like if you're an employee at Starlandia, I don't care if you don't know anything about art. As long as you say, Welcome to Starlandia and you say so in a nice, genuine, smiley manner, then like you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine with me. Um, because yeah, like you, I want everybody that comes into the store to just feel like, oh, okay, I can be here. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, 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 they are, the people working here are glad that I'm here. And, and that was interesting in New York because I definitely didn't necessarily feel that way all the time. See, when I go through TSA up there and they're like, get back in line. I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I'm home. <laughs> I'm home. <laughs> My people. <laughs> are you still making art? Are you still interested in animation or filmmaking or any sort of? Not really. I mean, sometimes I'll like. I was making. I was. I was interested in making like really high end paper mache lamps, um, like lamp bases earlier this year, and then I just like never finished any of them. Um, and uh, I think I want to make more art related to like signage around the store this summer, um, but I don't think I make art anymore really i'm cool with that i will if i wanted to i have a cool art store i've talked to, go to. <laughs> yeah right exactly you know where to get everything if you need anything um i've talked to some other people who are not artists professionally mm -hmm. but they have some sort of outlet mm -hmm. um and if it, whether or not that's important for them. So my outlet currently is trying to figure out how computers work. Um, I've been doing a lot of these sort of, uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I think my outlet is just sort of being curious in something. Um, and not planning 30 years out, just kind of. And yeah, and being like totally cool with that. I'm so on board with actually with like for the next five months being really interested in like in computers and specifically transistors and logic gates and never, ever, ever applying any of that at any time in my life to anything useful. And I'm totally down with that. Like I have no desire to actually become a computer scientist or to build a computer or to like, this probably has no actual application to my daily life, but it is interesting and it is something that um, is definitely like an outlet for me and is a way to sort of engage my brain in a different way. Um, 
You're stagnating too much. You're like, I'm going to learn something I know nothing about. Yeah, and I'm, <laughs> I don't care what I get out of it. And I am um, I feel like I've kind of do- I've been doing that for a minute, but I've really started to engage just like, oh, I don't care. I'm just going to learn. I'm just going to do it. Um, and I'm having a blast. I just got this cool, like, oscilloscope and breadboard from my friend Murray. And I was playing with like resistors and I blew so many LEDs. I mean, I just completely blew them apart. Um, and I have no idea why. So uh, that's fun. It's just fun to make mistakes. <laughs> it's just, especially like in like, there's no risk. There's just no risk at all. And I'm just like, doop a doop a doop, playing mad scientist. And it's so much fun. Hmm. So I still don't know how computers work. I really have no idea. I don't think anybody does. I think when like when cr- creating art um there is this part of yourself that has to be like i don't care what anyone's gonna think of it um i just need to do if i'm writing song lyrics or mm-hmm. if I'm, I'm painting mm-hmm. it's like you keep it po- keeps popping in your brain like what are people gonna are people gonna like this and then you have to be like i don't care I'm screw just, it <laughs> just do nobody it. cares it's nobody a, cares yeah yeah nobody exactly. cares and then, um, and then, yeah, so you just, like, find what makes you happy and um, do that. And then that came, to me, that came later in life. Have you always been pretty confident in who you are and what you, you know, stand for kind of thing? I think so. Kind of, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, um, yeah, I think that's evolved as to maybe why I feel comfortable um, and it, maybe it went from just being like not aware to being aware and then maybe a little bit like s- concerned about being aware and now I'm aware and I just don't care. Does that make sense? Nope. All right, great. <laughs> Perfect. I don't care. I just don't care. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know? Also, I think running for office over the last year was really like, oh, I really don't care. Like, I really don't care. And that has been so freeing. Mm. Um because I feel like I, I now know what it feels like to actually really care, um, to like be second guessing kind of everything you do all the time. Because uh, when I was running for office, it was just, it's such a like, am I talking to this person in the right way? Am I crossing the street in, a, in the right way? Am I like shopping the right way? Am I looking the right way? Am I posting on Facebook the right way? Am I answering the phone the right way? Am I going to work? Am I driving? Like, am I doing this the right way? So I don't a vote and now i just oh my god it was crazy and now i'm just like "Mm, i don't care (laughs) and i think that if i were to run for office again which i think i probably would um i would approach it with with a little bit less of that i think it's still i mean like you still definitely have to you know if you want to win then you have to you know curry favor with everybody and that is such a difficult and enormous task um but i would probably just not care as much and try to be more of my authentically messy self Mm. which i'm a disaster and i'm also a child so that's what i'm definitely sure of so anything on the horizon like any have you thought about like if you were to run for something or if you were to join another organization is there anything well i'm trying to do some murals right now um i think that would be fun we need a lot more murals in town um i'm trying to do more public art um uh hopefully i'll be re-censured by the cat board which is always exciting i was already censured once and it's censured not censored censured once so i'm gonna try to get censured again because that was fun um and uh the store is just doing great so we're continuing to reinvest and grow that um as much as possible um i want to do a play i want to be in a play i don't know i really don't know what advice would you give to a 17 year old version of yourself oh um back in home don't listen to that stranger Never mind. Uh, <laughs> the stranger being me. That's some weird person. 17 me back at home. Um, I don't know. I think I would be too concerned that I would alter where I'm at right now. How about it's right? not you, but it's just somebody that's... Just some remind- other 17-year-old? Yeah, yeah, that reminds you of you, like a young version of yourself. I would say um, respect yourself, respect others, and be safe. Because I have a 
14 year old friend who sometimes works at the store and I tell them that very often. And I think it's very key. As long as they're respecting themselves and really thinking about what that means and respecting others and being safe, they're probably gonna be just fine. And also nobody cares, you know? And just like, just do it, just do it. But do it in the context of respecting yourself, respecting others and being safe. As long as you're following those, then just do it. Just go for it. Mm. So that's what I would say to anybody. I like it. Um, what um, What do you want to plug? Um, How can people find out? Can people connect with you? Can people follow you somewhere? Can people visit a website? You know, go to a I would follow media? Starlandia. It's cool. It's a fun little page to follow and go shopping at Starlandia. Um, and if you're living in town, you should write a letter to the MPC that you like my mural idea for a free form mural wall where there will be like anybody can just go and paint on the mural. That's mm. my plan. It's not a design, it's an open free for all. Mm. Um, which was kind of difficult to like communicate to NPC staff. They were like, yeah, but who's the artist? And I'm like, there is no artist. And they were like, okay, but what's the design? And I was like, there is no design. <laughs> you just say paint here. Anybody can paint here. So, so go, you know, make, I'm trying to make that happen. And letters of support would be great. Um, is there a website or anything for that? No. Yeah the mpc.org but you need to google it because if you type it in it doesn't work okay um i'll link it below i don't know i would honestly i would just i i wouldn't really plug i don't have much to plug if you need art supplies go to starlandia um and then just get involved in your local neighborhood association i think that's a big thing like get involved and do good work um find something that's local and get involved with it and um, figure out a way to not be a burden for that organization, but to actually help and um, and make make more art, make murals happen. You know, download podcasts, support people, and um, you know stuff like that. So, in upcoming episodes of the Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals to help discover their path to success. Um, if you have episode feedback or guest suggestions, you can email me at wecreatetruth at gmail.com. You can visit the website creative-truth.com to learn more, get some swag, get some mug, get some hats, apparel. Mm -hmm. um, you, If you're listening on iTunes, please leave me a good review. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. I appreciate you listening. Clinton, I appreciate you spending some oh time God. with me on this a Wednesday This has been an absolute morning. pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks. Thank you.